This is The Law Show on CL 650. Now back to the show. Hey, and welcome back to The Law Show on CL 650. David Halkett joins us in studio from Macquarie Hunter and Sarah Morse, associate of Macquarie Hunter, both in the family law division there. And we've been talking about real estate and uh, separation and divorce. Now, there are still some items uh, that need to be separated. Um, Pensions. That is something that maybe one person knows is valuable and the other one does not. Well, pensions, there's there's two types. There's... um the defined benefit, which is most government pensions are defined benefits. So you pay in for a certain amount and you get X percentage of your best five years of income. It doesn't matter how many years you were in there, you get your money. So um, federal government pensions are a little bit different. They're under federal statute, but same basic concept. Right. And most uh, fireman pensions, civil servant pensions in BC are, are su- what they call superannuation, which are, which are those type of pensions. Um, there's also defined contribution pensions that a lot of firms have. A lot of big non-government businesses went to defined contribution because that limits what the company is at fault is at is liable for. So mm-hmm. it's they're basically group RSPs. There may be a matching from the from the the business, but it's basically a group RSP. So whatever you've put so in, you put a dollar in, they match a dollar. Those sorts yeah. of things, right? And so at the end of the day, it's whatever you've put in plus the match and whatever growth there's been. That's what you get. Uh, the defined contribution pension often. They'll come some or defined benefit, I should say, will come in and say, "Well, I've my pension's ninety thousand. Well, no, that's what your contributions may be, but really, it sometimes can be four or five times that is the actual value because mm-hmm. you're getting a, you know, five four thousand five thousand a month for twenty thirty years." Well, it's interesting. I had a um, a friend who uh, spends time in Florida and they're retired, and the and the husband is ninety six years old. And mm-hmm. I said, "Well, how do you get insurance?" For a 96 year old to be in Florida yeah. during the winter, and they said, "Oh, he was a school teacher." Yeah, so he said uh, his... and it so it still gets all of his benefits. I'm like, well, that is expensive. Yeah, um, so that is valuable. Oh yeah, for sure. And and so often you divide um, survivor benefits, other benefits that you get under the plan as well. So who do you go to determine that? Is there a, a, a actuators? Well, or... actuaries deal with actuaries. Them. That's what yeah, I'm they 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 can value him, um, but usually what. I recommend to a lot of my clients is divide it as per our act, which simply says you get X percentage based on the number of years together versus the number of years that the person's paid in to the pension, because then you get a, a source of income down the road. Now, you and so how does that done with the pension? Is the pension notified that yes. come yep. 65, they're going to pay, we'll pick $2,000, $1,000 goes to Bob and $1,000 goes to Sally. Is that how it works? Yeah. Well, um, you, you, Divide the pension based on whatever day you were together yeah. to the day you separated. Then you pay the fee of, I think it's $750 or something like that to the pension office. They divided a source. And so it's in effect two pensioners mm. at the time. And they, they will give you your options. You can get a lump sum, put in a locked in RSP, or you can just say, when that person's eligible to get their money, I will start getting it. And you want to get the, I always think it's better to take a, a guaranteed payment out mm-hmm. over time because there's, there's your, your cash flow down the road. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, um, what about uh, uh, savings plans that people have, RSPs, those sorts of things? How yeah, are they the, divided? It, just the same as any other, any other property, any other asset. So uh, again, I mean, if you had an RSP that you contributed to uh, prior to the date that you started uh, living with someone, then that it would just be the the increase mm-hmm. over the time that you were together. If you started it during the relationship, it would be half the value. So are these, when the divorce happens, are the assets inside the RSP need to be liquidated or is it just moved in kind or how does it done? You, you can, uh, you don't have to liquidate them and you can transfer them to a spouse by way of an order or agreement into another RSP tax-free. Mm-hmm. So you just, so if you have 500,000 RSP and your spouse has zero and you're going to equalize the 250 each, you would just, equalize it, 250 goes into an RSP of that person's designation, and then they pay the tax and take the money out. Now, what about uh, TFSAs and uh, things that are outside of RSPs? The the same process would apply in that it can, you can roll them over. Now, the good thing with TFSA is that there's no tax payable. So it, you can cash it in and not have to pay tax on it because it's after tax dollars. So mm-hmm. you can just transfer it to another, to, you can just give the cash to someone in that mm-hmm. situation. 
And what a lot of people do is they, you, you, you end up putting everything in a pot. You kind of look yeah. at all of the assets. And if one person has this much in TFSAs, this person has this much in this asset, and you can make it balanced. So you yeah. keep your RSPs if I keep my TFSAs and instead <laughs> of money going back and forth. So there's a way of making it work without having to do a lot of extra work going to your bank and things like that. And, and you can factor in the, ta- the, the tax payable. So on an mm-hmm. RSP, you may figure... 25% or 30% is going yeah. to be taxable when it's taken out. So you, if you're going to keep one different assets of different kind, so one taxable, one not taxable, you've kind of factor in the tax a little and you would. So if you had a, a TFSA of 500,000, it's not equal the same as um, an RSP of 500,000 mm-hmm. because one is not taxable and right. one is. Right. Okay. Yeah. Now on the... Um a state uh, show we had recently, uh, a lot of hard feelings and things come into who gets to go into grandma's house and, and pick something that they get to keep, right? Mm-hmm. So in a divorce, um, are there a lot of battles about, I want the painting that's over the mantelpiece mm-hmm. and somebody wants the, you know, whatever, the, the sports car, or like, how does it work? Definitely there can be. Um, Sarah's come to my office sometimes to talk about some of the, you know, our, the crazier our, our, story, our yeah. stories that are going on about how this is getting divided. The other party wants this. And, and my rule of thumb is I let our, my clients deal with the assets in the home because they're never really worth as much as they think. Mm-hmm. I've had parties come in and say, I paid 4000 for that TV. You can get a bigger, better TV. For 1200 bucks. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So it doesn't matter you paid for it. What would you get for it now? Sure. So you can bring in an auctioneer who will value everything. And if the parties can't agree on how to divide up the stuff in the house... The court will just order it all sold mm. and divide the proceeds. Most don't want that because then to replace it, it's going to cost them more. Mm-hmm. So if you have two TVs and you're both moving to different houses, take one each. You know, um, if you have uh, a bed, you may only have one bed, but you got to figure out how to divide that up and, you know, and you can factor it in. Usually the difference in money is pretty minimal. At the what end about the collections like um, yep. China sets or, mm-hmm. or uh, you know, they got a, Tools. 500 yeah. record collection or something. Tools yep. are a big one. Tools are um, nice. A lot of times if you have someone that has a business that that requires high-end tools. Like or snap-on like, tools or with yeah, a with lot the, of money. the big containers yeah, and, yeah. and that sort of thing. And sometimes the, the person that owns the tools will try and say, say, oh, I get to keep my tools. But the other person knows those tools and those snap-on you know, containers, 10, grand. Uh, yeah, they can be worth Easily, a lot of money. Yeah. I, I've had to have tools valued. Because, you know, one party believed that the mm-hmm. tools were a lot more valuable than the other person was indicating. So you can't forget about things like that and, and you know, collections, records, vehicles, and, and things like that. There, there can be significant yeah. value and there's the sentimental value. Now, what about heirlooms? For example, um, your, your uh, grandparent gave you something that's mm-hmm. quite valuable and the other person wants to take it just because they know it's valuable mean so because their your grandma left it to you is it automatically yours well i would argue that that would be a gift under the inheritance and and you'd only have to if it increase in value would you have to share it no right. no court's going to make you give up you know your grandma's wedding ring or something mm-hmm. I, I couldn't see that right for sure and usually what i'd tell my client if he was pushing or or was pushing to get that heirloom from his wife or vice versa, I would tell him, don't be silly. You're mm-hmm. going to look, it's going to make you look bad in court and you have better arguments on other issues. Don't fight on those small things. Save your money and your fight for the important issues, such as your children or mm-hmm. those kind of things. And then what about pets? Pets are an interesting one. Um, we don't see them as people, assets. Yeah. You know, they're, they're like, you know, we all call them our furry son or our furry daughter or something, right? But the court still looks at them as, as if they are a table and a chair mm-hmm. in that the law is clear. They're, they're chattels, they're assets. Dividing them can be brutal, though, because there's no uh, set, set up in – there's nothing in the act that says we can divide the time that you have with a, a dog mm-hmm. or a cat. And so – Usually, there can be a compensation for the value, but again, it's you know you, you may have paid four thousand for the dog when he was a puppy, but he's ten or eleven years old. How do you divide up mm-hmm. what's remaining? Um, that can be a lot of um, emotional aspects in cases, and I know Sarah's had them. We're fighting over a cat and stuff. Oh yeah, Fluffy the cat was in uh, in an agreement, mm-hmm. and the, I've had parties want to basically have a 
a parenting schedule for their dog. Mm-hmm. And they uh, they agreed. As a dog owner, I could see, I can see I, that. I, I yeah, can understand course. it. Yeah, I mean, maybe the maybe the dog goes back and forth when the kid goes back and mm-hmm. forth, and it's understandable. I mean, there's an emotional connection there, so oh, yeah, it can be a very especially if it's your kid, if that pet is you know you know what the two people have shared, and they don't have children yet. The very first, emotional. The first child syndrome. Yeah, the exactly. pet. We'll yeah. get the the practice uh, pet. And, and, the kids. And, and even just in just practical terms, though, when it comes to it, usually when you were going through the divorce period before you separated, you may not have been speaking to your spouse. There's only if, if there was no children, there's only one one live at live being being yeah. in in the in the house that was actually being nice to you. Yeah, <laughs> source, your, source your of pet. comfort, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Like that, you know, regardless of what. You know, anyway, your dog always loves you. Exactly, they always are happy mm-hmm. to see you, no matter whether or not your wife doesn't want to talk to you anymore. <laughs> the dog's always happy to see you. So when your wife says you're getting the doghouse, the husband's like, oh, "Okay, I'll take yeah, that." Exactly, <laughs> the dog still loves me. Well, that was the old joke with uh, with Bill Clinton after all the Monica Lewinsky stuff was that the only the only person or live being in the in the White House who was talking to him was his dog <laughs> coming to say hi, right? You know. That kind of thing. So, All right. With our one minute left, what's your advice for people before they come to see you? Well, figure out, make a list of your assets, uh, your liabilities, um, a list of the incomes, uh, list out what the children, their ages, where they go to school, what the plans are for them, if at all possible. It makes us going meeting with you a lot simpler. Mm-hmm. And, and we can get to the important issues instead of having to spend, say, 20 minutes of the first hour getting that basic information. All right. Thank you very much to uh, David Halkett and Sarah Morse from Macquarie Hunter in the Family uh, Law Division. I'm sure it's never boring. It isn't. It's your end of the hall, all right? No, it isn't. (laughs) All right. Thank you very much. That's all the time we have for uh, this edition of The Law Show. I'm Zach Spencer. Speak to you next time on CL650.